Hello and welcome everybody to the Non Air Never podcast, the home of all things Burnley Football Club. But this week we've got a very special episode and I'll be your host, George Poole, standing in for, of course, Natalie Bromley. Now, we know it's the international break at the moment and international football can get a bit tedious, especially when Patrick Bamford is somehow playing for England. So we've got an incredibly special guest this week, folks. Michael Hodkinson. And for those of you who don't know Michael, he's releasing a new book all about Burnley Football Club and Blackburn Rovers. But it's not just a history of the two clubs. It's a history of the rivalry, which we know is all so special. So the book is called No Name Ever, Blackburn Rovers versus Burnley. And it will be released in the coming month, where you can find it via the Legends Publishing website. Now, Michael, before we get into the book and the Burnley and Blackburn rivalry, please just t- tell us a bit about yourself. How, what's your background like and how did you get into football, not just as a fan, but just as playing it yourself? Well, I, I, I played at school um, like, like a lot of people do. I played for the school team and um, I, I, I then went to college and um, to, um, to train as a teacher and uh, when I came back to Darwin, which is, is where, where I'm from, um, we, we, we started our own football team immediately after the 66 World Cup. Um, I, it's, it's interesting how, just how many teams did, um, did, did commence their history in 1966. Unfortunately, this one only lasted about four years. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, So I, I played into my mid-30s, but I got very, very involved in schools football as well. And... Um, uh, ran school sides, um, was secretary of the Blackburn and Darwin Schools Football Association, particularly with the town team, and, and that was very, very big in the 70s and 80s. Sadly, schoolboy football is, is dying to death now, but um, but in the 70s and 80s, it was massive. I, I, um, I, I was then on the English Schools FA National Council for, for several years as well, um, sort of being involved with boys who, who were internationals and several of whom, you know, um, carry, carried on successfully to become um, in, in England players. And um, I, I, I just I just love football, you know. I mean, like like many people who I suspect are, are, are listening to this and, uh, and, and, and who go on to Turf Moor, they, they just love the game. And... Um, I, I I just got this idea um, about two years ago that it would that it would be nice to write uh, the hist- the history of of both clubs sort of running side by side. Um, so it's not just it's not say the history of Burnley followed by the history of Blackburn Rovers. It, it, it's a sort of year by year history of each club and sort of comparing where. Uh, in any given year, where they are vis-a-vis the, the, their, their, their rivals. And it's amazing how this rivalry has grown. You, 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 although it, it was there from the very off in, 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 in the, um, well, 1888, it, it commenced officially. I mean, there, there, there were several tasty moments back then, but it certainly developed massively, I think from about the 19, from about 1960-ish really, in, into what it is now. Yeah, this this brings up something that I, I absolutely loved when, when reading the book. And it's obviously your interviews with many of the ex-players. I think there's over 30 in total. And I just wanted to read an extract of what Graham Branch said about the rivalry. So this is Graham Branch who said, I played in the Merseyside derby, the Glasgow derby and the Istanbul derby. And I have never seen a rivalry as fierce as this. So, Michael, does does this game live up to the, those great those greats of football? Little old Burnley against Blackburn is the rivalry that big? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think you've got to listen to the pros on this one because they they know they're they're right in the middle of it. Um, Andy Payton, you know, a, a legend at Burnley, he he told me that um, he, he he could not believe the similarities between stepping out at, for for an East Lancashire derby. And for a Glasgow derby now, and maybe the Glasgow derby is the most tasty derby in Europe. Maybe uh, he, he played in that at, at Andy, 
Uh, he played for Celtic, but he, he said it was just the same when he played in the East Lancashire Derby. And and people who were, I mean, obviously Andy was he was a padding boy, isn't he? And and, and he, he he was brought up on it um, as as a lad. But these people coming from different clubs, different parts of the country, they they've been absolutely stunned by. Just, just what it was like within the town, you know, with people stopping them in the streets and 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 wanting them to go out and, and annihilate the opposition on on the um, you know in 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 the week leading up to it and so on, and certainly certainly one one or two of the of, of the Blackburn players, um, uh, in particular uh, Sam Garner and, and, and David Dunn, you know they they, they they've all, almost sort of got, got a reputation in Burnley as as Mister Evil, really, um, just because they they had success playing against them in, in in the local derbies. So yeah, I mean, I think you've got to say that that, that it stands up there with with, with the vast number of, um, of of derbies that, that, that there are around around Europe. Um, in terms of crowds, obviously, you, you know, the, 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 there is a limit, but to, to the number of people who can watch them. But uh, there's they're certainly um, quite frenetic. They're frantic, and uh, and at times not very nice as well. Of course. Yeah, you're not wrong there. I mean, even mentioning David Dunn uh, in my room that 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 does bring a sour <laughs> taste to the mouth. I, I, I know we've seen him around Brockhall and a, a few times around Wally. And as soon uh, whenever I see him, I think, oh god, oh god, it's done it. Uh, but we've touched on the, the hatred and sort of the vitriol between the two clubs there. But you, you've got a really unique case to tell in that you, you're a Blackburn Rovers season ticket holder, but almost count Burnley as sort of a, a secondary team, am I right? And you have an, an affinity with both clubs in a way, which I think is quite special as well and something which a lot of our listeners just won't understand or won't, won't even, yeah, won't understand. So please explain explain how... How is it that a man who's got a ticket in the Jack Walker stand also has an affinity for Burnley? It's really unique. Well, when I when I finished teaching and 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 and, and I came off the English Schools Council, a guy called Jeff Taylor, who sadly died only a few months ago, who who was in in charge of the youth setup, really the 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 the, the younger the, the younger kids at Garthorpe for for a lot of years. And uh, he, he, his sons have both played for the Blackburn Town Team, Blackburn and Dawn Schools Town Team. And, and he came to see me. He said, do you fancy doing a bit of scouting for, for Burnley at, uh, at, at, at schoolboy level? And I said, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I did that for about eight years. And <laughs> I suppose at first it was a little bit through gritty teeth. But then the more I was going down to Gawthorpe, and the more I, I could feel myself being drawn into this club. And and the, there was a very, very strange incident in my life, really. Um, the um, the first Derby... My mind's gone a bit blank on, on what year it was. The first Derby... Was it uh, 2000? 2000, yeah. The, the, the first Derby for, for donkey's years, really. And... Um, it was it was at Turf Moor, and, and and Jeff said, "I'll get you a ticket if you want." And I thought, "No, I I, I don't want to go and sit with Burnley fans." Um, and, and it was on Sky, so I, I chose to watch it with on Sky. And as I sat down in, in, in my armchair, you know, in the, the minutes leading up to the game, I wasn't one hundred percent certain who I wanted to win. And it was only sort of, but as soon as, as, as the referee blew his whistle, I, I knew then um, that I'd got, I don't know, 50 odd years of supporting Blackburn weighing down heavily on me. And there was absolutely no way on earth that I could not support them on that day. But it, 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 it did need some thinking about, really. So that shows that how, how close I got to Burnley without ever losing this wonderful love affair I've got with Blackburn Rovers, really. That, that's brilliant. Yeah, and uh, I think it's the, it's this case with many people around the area that 
it, it literally is almost a flip of the coin of who you support. It's it's you've got a granddad here, you've got a, a family member here who go, goes down Rovers or goes to Turf. I, I know for yourself, it was it was a it was a granddad. Am I right that got you into supporting Blackburn? And uh, hearing his tales as a kid, that led you to support one club where I think you freely admit that it could quite have easily been Burnley. You'd, you'd have had that same love for Turf Moor in a way. Well, I, I'm certain that if I'd have been born in Padium, in Nelson Corn or Burnley, maybe in Haslinden, maybe in Clitheroe, you know, maybe in Accrington. I, I consider Haslinden, Clitheroe and, and, uh, and Accrington the border towns, really. Um but if I if I'd have been on born on, if you will, on the wrong side of the border, I'm certain, one hundred percent certain, that I would have been a Burnley supporter till I die, um, because I think with many people that's the way it is. Um, it, geography, family, friendship groups are, are possibly the three main reasons why you support a club. You know, thankfully, it's not because. They, they, they win everything, you know. I mean, I, I, I can't cope with people who support a club because they win everything. Um, because it's, it, it, it's hard. It's hard at times supporting a club, particularly if the club's not doing well. And I have so much time for those people who, who, who packed um, Turf Moor uh, in 1987, I think it was, uh, um, for that game against Orient, which was a, a life or death game. You know, the... If they, I think if they'd have only drawn, they, they they would have been out of the league, and well, they, they probably would have got back in. But but you never know, do you? Really, you know, there are teams like Workington who've never got back in, and um, you know, who, 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 who fallen out for some reason. Gate said the, the, these sort of teams, you know, and you know, for those, I think there was about seventeen thousand on that day. This was at the very very bottom of the. I think it was the yeah it was the fourth division then, you know seventeen thousand crowd. I mean that's that's something that isn't it. And in the book, I I I wouldn't say I don't like Manchester United. They're not my favourite club, and and I've certainly respect for people who were who were true supporters of Manchester United. You know I I I, I respect them, but I do say in the book that it took far more guts to be at Turf Moor that day than it did. In, um, in 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 Barcelona in 1999, when 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 United won 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 the Champions League again, you know it took some guts to get down to Turf Moor that day. And I've I've what the one or two people I've spoken to in uh, for for the book and, and people I really respect who said I, I I couldn't go. What one guy said, my wife won't let me go because she she said, I, and you might have a heart attack. She said, you're not going. And another guy said, I, 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 I sort of listened on the radio all the way through, not really wanting to listen. Yeah, it's, it's bonkers. I think my dad was actually the same in that he, he either couldn't go or he, he didn't want to go just because it's just too much too much heartache for, for mm. someone to bear. But I think that's what's v- very special about, in particular, the North West clubs and, and just clubs in the championship level who go through the ups, you go through the downs, but, but the ups are so much so much higher for, for going through the lows. I, I was speaking to Chris Sutton on, on the radio, actually, uh, last week, and he said, doesn't it get boring as a, as a Burnley fan under Sean Dice? And I said, boring? We've played the likes of Peterborough in the Championship when I was growing up, when I was seven, we, you know, 17 games without, without a win under Steve Cottrell. So, no, thank you very much, Chris. It isn't boring <laughs> because the highs are incredibly, are, in, are incredibly high right now. But it, it does make you think in that, a lot of the clubs around the North West have so much in common with each other. Working class clubs, you know, we really don't have the, the finances that the big cities can draw. So, so I want to ask you, why is it then that, like but like as a Burnley fan, I have a real affinity for Accrington Stanley. And I, I, I'd love to see them doing well. I think it's brilliant that they're punching rightly above their weight in League One at the moment. So why don't, why don't Burnley and Blackburn have that? Where, in your opinion... Has this rivalry seeped from? Has is it from them fighting over the canal, as I, I've, I've heard you talk about recently? Where does this rivalry come from? Why aren't we all friends like Burnley and Accrington Stanley? Well, of course, way back in eighteen eighty eight, there, there was an Accrington. They, they were founder members of the Football League, along with Burnley and the Rovers and Preston and Bolton and so on. You know, from from round here, 
and um, but sadly they dropped away after about I think about about five or six years and and, and they, they went out of existence. Um, and and I, I think that I, I I think it's more it's more of a Burnley thing than it is of a Blackburn thing. And even Brian Douglas said that to me. He said he said I I always got the impression that the Burnley crowd wanted their their side to win that little bit more than the Rovers crowd did. And 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 my son's fiance uh, who, who's been brought up. Uh, you know, by Burnley loving parents, she's from Burnley and so on. She says, and she, and she went, she's been on Turf Moor a lot, but she's also been on the Eagles several times because my son dragged her along, just dragged her along there. And she said she, fe- <laughs> she feels the Rover, the Rovers crowd are just a little bit more posh than the Burnley crowd. Now, I don't know, you know. I, mean, I, I, I questioned this myself after I heard you say it. And I, funnily enough, I think if I was to ask myself, I'd say, yeah, they probably are, but I'd, I'd, I have no idea where it where it stems from. Maybe it's just this underdog mentality that I, yeah. I do think I do think Burnley have, or, or or maybe it's because Blackburn Rovers were started by like ex public and grammar school boys. Who knows? It might go that far back. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there, there was certainly there was certainly a rivalry within the first three or four years. I mean, there, there was this wonderful game game that got abandoned in a snowstorm when. Uh, Unbelievably, ten of the Rovers players walked off, leaving the goalkeeper. And why the goal has stayed on, God only knows. And when Burnley were caught offside, and then of course, if you're if you're only playing against against one person, you, you you're going to get caught offside unless you're very very careful. Um, and, and and the the Burnley the Rovers keeper sort of took about five minutes to take the free kick. So well, it's just ten, what tends to happen these days in the games, isn't it? If if a side's winning one 0 it seems to take an eternity for the goalkeeper to take it. So maybe maybe they learnt from this goalkeeper of the Rovers back in the in the eighteen nineties. But what I'm trying to say is that this started with a fight on the pitch, and um, and, and the ref sent to play from both sides off, and the the Rovers believed that it, it, the, the the Rovers player hadn't done that much wrong. Reading some account, accounts, I think he, he had done something wrong, you know, but. Uh, but, but I I think also, just looking at the rivalry, I, I think I think geography plays a part because the Rovers are more in the middle of, of a lot of teams. Um, when Bolton played at Burnden, which is almost in the centre of, um, of of Bolton, and Preston were obviously playing at Deepdale, um, Burnley playing at Turf Moor, it, they were almost exactly all three of them about the same. Di- distance apart from Ewood. I think I think it's two thirteens with Preston and, and, and Bolton and eleven ish to Turf Moor. So in in a sense the the Rovers had had a choice of who, 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 who their their close rivals could be. But you look at Burnley, all right, I mean you you've got the Pennines between well I mean Halifax Town, you know, who've gone, uh, we're out of the league now. Bradford, Brad, I suppose Bradford going east are about the furthest, aren't they? The nearest, sorry. Um, you go north and you probably hit Carlisle before you find a football team. But you come wet and you go south and, and Berry's about 20 odd miles, I think, from, from Burnley. But so the Rovers were the nearest team for Burnley. And and so I, I just have this hunch that, that the rivalry probably came more from Burnley than it did, it did from Blackburn. Yeah, no, I I think you, you you're almost bang on there because even just thinking about it myself, there's there's no t- when wait, if someone asked me who are Burnley's rivals, I'd say two teams. I'd say Blackburn. <laughs> it goes without saying, really. And then I would just about say Preston, but that's really only because since since I was like t- since I was about ten, we, we really haven't played Blackburn all that much, and it's it's playing Preston in the Championship year on year that our rivalry yeah, develops. Yeah. For, for me with Burnley yeah, and Preston yeah. but that, that's not because of particularly because we're all so close together it's it's because we've played together and we've not played against the Rovers as much mm. so so yeah I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that it is more from the Burnley side but do you think it is also because of this sort of there is a, an underdog mentality I, I mean just just with reading your book I was the amount of times that I picked out maybe it's because I had that mentality in my head I picked out oh Blackburn, a, a bit header of Burnley here, whether it was the buying the, the way to FA Cups uh, from, from you know, in the late 1800s to having the big influence on the Lancashire FA 
sending even I remember reading uh, about them sending the youth players to play at Turf Moor because they saw themselves as that superior. I mean, you wouldn't even dream of doing such a thing now. But but even even back in those days, Blackburn had many England internationals uh, before Burnley did. There always seems to have been this Blackburn are the team above. Do you agree with that, or maybe is that just with because because I grew up with uh, being the only Burnley kid in a primary school? <laughs> no, I, I I think you're right. Um, uh, particularly sort of all the way through to well, just after the se- the Second World War, really. Um, the, 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 there are there are different ways of trying to decide who who is or has been the best club. I mean, you can look at Honors one, and, and the Rovers are, are streets ahead there. Um, you can look at who's which club has been in in the top division most, and again, the Rovers are a fair way ahead of Burnley there. Um, but amazingly, if you look at the Derbies, they are absolutely neck and neck. In fact, it's a dead heat at the moment. They've, in, in official games, that's not counting things like the Anglo-Scottish and the Manx Cup and stuff like that. The, 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 in, in, um, in, in league FA Cup and, 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 and League Cup games, they've played each other exactly 100 times. And they've both won exactly, I, th- I think it might be 41, something like that, games each. It, it's absolutely, it, 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 it's impossible to be closer. Um, so that sort of shifts it a little bit. But the other one is the bragging rights. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that Burnley have the bragging rights at the moment. If you've been in a higher division than your opposition for six seasons, um, you, you've got bragging rights. Um, but, you know, you talk about your your, your upbringing. Um, I, I sort of got into football in, in, in the early 50s, early to mid 50s. And and in all that time, Burnley were a first division club, and the Rovers were a second division club. And it wasn't until nineteen fifty eight that the Rovers managed to get in back into the first division. So I grew up really believing that Burnley were a bigger club than the Rovers. So I th- I think it depends to some extent at what time in history you come into this debate, really. Yeah, that that just seems complete, completely alien to me. Uh, for throughout all, all my primary school and secondary school days, I was, I mean, in particular primary school, I was the only Burnley fan in in the year group, or at least in two year groups. It was surrounded by Blackburn fans, and I suppose I wanted to ask you a bit later, but we've we've come on to it naturally now. Is how do you see this rivalry going forward? Obviously, with with Burnley now, clearly, you know, in a really strong position with Sean Dash at the helm. We have got the new owners. Do do you see it, it it becoming more of a even in our local area more Burnley fans than Blackburn fans because I just think f- from a mindset from for for little kids growing up around here now no longer will Blackburn and Ewood be the place to go and you know, they'll go and buy the blue and white halves I think there'll be more kids now growing up and oh I want to buy that that Burnley shirt if 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 they're not tempted too far too far afield from uh, the likes of Liverpool and Manchester City that is. You need a crystal ball, don't you, really, to, to, to answer that question. But I must admit at the moment that it, if if the Rovers can stay in the championship at the moment, I, I, can, I can live with that because they're, they're not good enough to... Uh, I mean, they could get into the playoffs, but how they would, how they would fare in the Premier League it doesn't, doesn't bear thinking about at the moment. But as you know, thing, things do change. And, you know, it, I mean, Burnley haven't made the greatest of starts. Um, I, mean, I know it's very, very early days yet, but, um, you know, it, they, they could drop down a division. I, I think it's more likely that Burnley will drop down a division than the Rovers will go up one, which will saddle me, saddle me massively. I, I want to see Derby games, but I want to see them in the Premier League. I don't want to see Derby games again in the Championship. Because that, in in a sense, that's where these two clubs deserve to be. You know, looking looking back at their contribution to to the game of football. Yeah, wouldn't that be so special? I mean, we've only seen, as far as I can think, we've only seen two derby games between the clubs in the Premier League era, uh, two thousand nine and two thousand and ten. Right, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, when we went up, 
yeah, I am right there. I, f- I thought so. I was questioning myself there. But it, I think it's interesting when we were touching on earlier, talking about how maybe Burnley fans sort of have more emotional attachment to the to the derby, whether it be because Blackburn have got other rivals, etc. The, the thing that I've found in recent years is that when when I was a kid, and obviously we hadn't beaten beaten the enemy, as we should say, or beaten our near neighbours uh, for 34 years, it, it, it ate me up inside. It was horrible. I, I really felt, oh, we were oh, just scratching and clawing to get up to Blackman's level. And, and now the shoe is almost on the other foot. And when I talk to my uh, Blackman fans who are friends, they're almost apathetic about the, the rivalry with Burnley. It, it, it's The switch has been flicked so quickly that Burnley have suddenly, in the last five years, are seen as the superior rival. rival. And there's almost a, an apathy amongst the Blackman fans that I know t- t- towards the rivalry. I don't know if you've, you've experienced it yourself, because when, when I was younger, even though we were a, a, the, the lower club, the inferior club, it, it ate up at me and I wanted to claw, I wanted to get up there to Blackburn. But now all I, all I get from my Blackburn friends is just apathy, which is sad in a way. Well, I mean, I mean, sadly, from my point of view, I, I have an awful feeling you might you might be right there. Um, I I don't hear uh, much being said from from all the Blackman people I know about about playing Burnley again. You know, they're more concerned with stay staying up really, um, and 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 somehow finding some money from somewhere. The, 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 these are the things that they tend to talk about. Um, but there again, you know, it, it, what 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 you're probably doing there is, is what we were talking about a few minutes ago. The, yeah, but Bur- Burnley, I think, did a wonderful job as underdogs, really, um, if I can say that. Um, and 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 I think that that was classic underdog behaviour by you in those days. Now. <sighs> I couldn't. I can't say at all that um, that the Rovers aren't underdogs now. They are underdogs now compared with Burnley. But I, I, I don't quite get that the the Rovers supporters really feel that they're underdogs to Burnley as yet. Now, if it goes on for another ten seasons, I mean, it might be different. I mean, you you, you know, you were talking about thirty odd years there, weren't you? You know, um, I think we've had six now, haven't we? So. But but it, it, it's uh... an eleven since eleven since Rovers last beat us twenty ten. Don't worry, I've, I've got I've got the counting on my wall. <laughs> eleven years scratched off. <laughs> yeah, because there was there were a series of draws, weren't there? Of course. Um, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, it's this very interesting point you made there. But but it is it it seems to be the case with the clubs, especially, and I don't think I really appreciated it as much until I did. Uh, read read the the non a never book and I, it made me think. I, I think in your own words, you said the clubs are almost in a state of a seesaw when one's up, one's down, and it seemed like we had maybe in my lifetime we had two two years or so in twenty eleven and twenty twelve when Blackburn had come down and we were both in the championship, but then all of a sudden Sean Dyche comes into Burnley and that seesaw again rocks up Burnley's way. But it it has seemed like that, hasn't it? In that. It's been rare in the club's histories that we've been on an even keel and just like two normal clubs competing against each other. That's absolutely true. That I, I, I mean, I've so, before I started to write this book, I, I had a pretty decent idea about the rivalry, but I, I hadn't twigged that, and, and and that came as a big shock to me. That the, the, there were great lengths of time when 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 what one club was far superior to the other. Even when they were both in the same division, I mean, even back in the very early stages, I think Burnley finished above the Rovers maybe twice in the first twelve years, and they were in the same league virtually all the time then. Um, and uh, and then, of course, that that period of time from forty eight, I think, through till uh, till till fifty eight, when 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 well, and he went he went beyond that. I think only in the eight years that the Rovers. And Burnley were in the in, in the first division together uh, between fifty eight and sixty six. There were only twice did the Rovers finish above Burnley in, in the league then. Um, so even though they were in the same league, you know the seesaw was very much uh, Burnley up and, and, and the Rovers down. But you know, Bur- it's a the Burnley story is a wonderful story because 
I don't know how they did it. They, they just could seem to be able to pull young players from absolutely anywhere. And, and every season, some some new star will come come onto the scene, and this of and, and this of course was, was a manna from heaven for Bob Lord because he he, he strove manfully to to keep the the, the, the club afloat really, um, and 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 so he could he, he would see somebody really good coming out of the reserves, and he would say right, well we'll sell this fella for. You know what? Maybe two hundred thousand, which of course in those days was an absolute fortune, and that's what that's went on. That went on year in, year out, um, from from the mid fifties really through to so till the mid seventies until suddenly it, it it all dried up. I think people like Lane James, um, Derek Scott, they, they, these these were the, the the last ones to really come through. There may have been one or two after that, but. Um, you know, and now, I don't know. It, it is um, the young winger McNeil. Is he off from from um, as he come through through the, the the development side and everything? Yeah, yeah. Is he? Is yes. Yeah, so we signed him when he was about four. He was about yeah, fourteen. Yeah. So we we claim him. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. we, we've made him a bit, a bit like we made Danny Ings. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I mean, if you're there at that age, then then they're your own, aren't they? Yeah. But is there anybody else in the current Burnley side who's uh, who's come through? Certainly, I, there's there's a young lad by the name of uh, Lewis Richardson. He's only about seventeen or eighteen, a young striker, but he seems to be banging them in fun. It, there is a real there's an interesting sort of tipping point at the club at the moment in that the the previous board obviously built the new training ground and in the sort of period between the the old board and the new board, there's been a lot of money put into the youth academy. And they've only recently, I think it was last year, gone up to that top tier uh, of the the status yeah. as uh, like a top tier one youth academy. Yeah. And the the word is that you know that the reaps of the rewards of that will come in two or three years down the line. So so it will be interesting to see if the if that sort of youth drive comes comes again because I mean you were speaking there about the the nineteen sixties and and how how Burnley managed to get all these young players a lot from from Ireland. It was sort of the same in reading the book in the, the late 1800s when it was it was Scotland players, oh, yeah. Scottish players who'd come down to Burnley. Yeah. But I, I, I was I was just reading today um, and I thought this was brilliant. I, I, I had no aware of the, the coincidence of it in that, for, for me, the, the one date for me in my lifetime for Burnley and Blackburn is the 9th of March 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Now we all know that's Burnley win at Ewood for the first time, yeah. 34 years. But for you, it's only three days out, but it's the 12th of March. 1960, and you were writing about that. This is the exact moment in, in the cup that season when you, you it dawned on you how big this derby game yeah. actually was. Could you yeah. tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, I mean, the and Burnley, well, Burnley won the, the, the Division One championship. Burnley were the best team in the country that year, and um, and, and the Rovers, I mean, the Rovers were a good side, they, 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 they were a, a a decent first division side, you know, halfway up the league sort of side, and uh, they, they both reached the sixth round, and um, and 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 Blackburn had won at Tottenham in 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 the fifth round, and Tottenham were 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 a great club then. Um, in, in fact, I think some people in Burnley regarded Tottenham as Burnley's chief rivals then. Um, but so, and then the draw came out for the sixth round, and. We were, it, was, it was amazing, really, because we were. I, I, I was at Dawn Grammar School, and I, and I think I was in the under fourteen side. And, and and our fixture on that Saturday morning was at St Theodore's in in Burnley, and uh, and and on the the draw came out, and 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 it was Rovers Burnley against Rovers in the afternoon. So we we sort of managed to get one or two parents to pick us up to 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 take us back in their cars, and um, and, and I, I, I can remember eating chips before the game to go on. And and I swear I was the first one on uh, about half past one. What well, well, what I did between half one and three, God only knows. But uh, um, and, and for 75 minutes, Burnley were magnificent. They, 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 they played football from another planet. They were 3-0 up. And the referee gave his terrible decision against Alex Elder. 
I mean, it did hit his hand. Maybe nowadays it would have been a penalty. But certainly in those days, it was never a penalty in a million years. Even we as Blackburn supporters didn't, you know, couldn't see how he gave it. El, El, El just sort of kicked the ball and, and obviously his, his arms were out a little bit, you know, as you have to do to keep your balance when you're playing. And it, and it sort of flew off the edge of his foot, hit his hand, you know, penalty straight away. And, and Douglas scored. And there was only 15 minutes to go. And... Uh, and speaking to, to Harry Potts, his son-in-law, which I did quite a bit in, in, in the book, he, he said he, he, is, he had net until the day he died, he never forgot those 15 minutes. He said they were they were about the first 50, the worst 15 minutes of his, of his, of his, of his life, really, as, as a football manager. And they always scored, scored two more goals. And well, we couldn't believe it when we walked off. It, it was it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful coming off as, as the Rovers supporters. And the Rovers had they went to extra time to the replay, but the the um, the Rovers came through two 0 and, and deserved to win on the night. But that first game, Burnley, Burnley were head and shoulders above the Rovers. Yeah, I I couldn't quite believe that when I was reading about Harry Potts hadn't hadn't gone over gone over this this Alex Elder penalty, you know, for as long as he lived. And you think of the, all the achievements that Burnley side. I mean, getting to the FA Cup final was it nineteen sixty two, and yet the still there was this one penalty, and okay, it might have been the fact that it was a dodgy penalty, but I'm sure there was a few of them back then. It was because it was Blackburn at home. Uh, and even though, you know, I think you're right, that P- for Pops, it wasn't a bigger game than the others. They were all important, but there was something special about that fixture, which clearly brought something out of him to then think about that one penalty for as long as he lived. Well, he, he, he f- I, I, I can, Philip Webster, who's his son-in-law, I, I, I can hear Philip now telling me that he said Harry felt that if if they lost the game, which which they should have won normally, he he would carry the can for that with the club. But he said on this occasion he was he had the weight of the whole of the population of Burnley on his shoulders. He said and and and, and that it takes some doing really. Yeah, it's just remarkable what. This fixture, and I suppose all, all the derby games, due to due to the players and to the managers and the owners. But one of the most extraordinary interviews that that you did that I found was Graham Alexander. Now this is a player who played for seven or eight years for Preston before joining Burnley. You know that's a local team, Preston. But when he came to Burnley, he said that he was shocked, shocked that this was a massive rivalry, and it almost hadn't it hadn't occurred to him. And when when we went up in the playoffs. He was surprised walking around Burnley to hear it wasn't oh let's we're going to play United. It was when's the Blackburn yeah. game? When's yeah, that day? That's right, it's yeah. just incredible. It, it's in, it's incredible to think I, I can I can picture Gresley walking through town thinking, hang on, I've just worked my socks off so we can play Arsenal and Chelsea. When's the Blackburn game? Yeah, <laughs> he must have been having a yeah. chuckle yeah. to himself. But it, is this something you're feeling that a lot of players? I think Kevin Ball was saying the same. He didn't expect it. A lot of players and maybe people from outside of the North West don't particularly understand that this rivalry is so big. I mean, I'd wager that a lot of Southern football fans, if you ask them who was the ri- the great rival of Burnley or Blackburn, some of them might not be able to tell you th- the name of the team. But it seems that when they come to the club, it- it's another picture because as we all know, it is such a big rivalry and it's up there with the with the greats of the game. But it just seems like, People don't know it outside of the northwest. Well, I mean, since you're talking about Kevin Ball, I mean, and 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 there, there's either a, a, a hero or a villain, depending on which shirt you're wearing, isn't it? But um, he 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 came down to to Burnley at the, the end the end of his career, really. You know, just to sort of play out a year or two, and, and he did very well actually. Uh, um, a hard man, and um, they they played Newcastle United. His first game at Burnley was a friendly against Newcastle United, and and the um, Newcastle had the centre forward, and and every time he he touched the ball, the Burnley crowd booed him, and and he said at half time he said, well, why are they all booing this the Newcastle centre forward, and and they said, well, it's Kevin Gallagher. He, he, so he says so. He said, well, he, he was at Blackburn, and he said so. You know, so he hadn't he still hadn't twig with him. Why? And then you know, he, he said he he soon, he soon learned you know why, um, but you know. <laughs> 
I mean, poor Kevin Gallagher, you know, <laughs> sort of. He, he couldn't get away from the Burnley from the Burnley fans, you know, even going up to Newcastle. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, when I was reading what Ross Wallace said to you, and he said, "Oh, I was walking around Burnley, and it seemed as though in 2013 and 14, a lot of Burnley fans would rather would choose beating Blackburn over winning promotion." And you just think, "Wow, it tells a tale, doesn't it, of how mm-hmm. big it, it really mm-hmm. is for the fans." Yeah, 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 yeah. I can still hear Ross saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, just going back to this, um, who who do you support thing? Really, um, it, not none of. I don't think any any of of the people I I um I spoke to, except perhaps somebody like David Dunn. Um, I'm just trying to think if, the, if there was a Burnley equivalent of David Dunn. Maybe Derek Scott. Um, uh, although, of course, Derek was from the North East and David's from well, East Lancashire, isn't it? Great old. But um, I wouldn't say any of the others really are, are sort of either sort of now died in the wool Burnley supporters or died in the wool Rovers supporters. But the affinity they have, they have with the club it's quite amazing really and and um you know several of them said you know the best days of my footballing career were at at the turf or or equal part you know so so it it obviously meant a lot to these to these players who who, i mean it must be difficult for a player mustn't it you you're a bit of a journeyman aren't you really you you, you're at a club as long as that club wants you or, or until somebody else comes along and wants to pay you a hell of a lot more money but but you you I mean, yeah. Imagine, imagine someone working for Microsoft developing a rivalry with Apple to this to this extent. You you couldn't imagine it. You could do in no, any other line no, of work. No, no, no. Um, I, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to think of of, of any anything else really that um, I, I I could say to you that that, that came up. I mean, I, I I I think I maybe mentioned this slightly early on, but I, but I I do have a go at. Um, at, at, at people who support teams for what would appear to be no apparent reason. Although having said that, of course, you've got to accept that we can all support who, who on earth we want to support. You know, who 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 am I or you to say that somebody should, uh, you know, support Burnley or support the Rovers or, or anything? But um, I, you know, you you, you said that uh, you you. In your class at school, where where did you go to school? By the way, what what's where 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 were you at school? So so I was in Barrow. Uh, oh, right. Oh, right. Border, and, border town. and it's and yeah, border towns exactly. So it, I I I think for a lot of my friends, it was the case of okay, we've got two local clubs here. Who do we support? Now, for me, all my family's from Burnley. So there was uh, funnily enough, the this just goes to tell you the. The, the extent of the rivalry, the, fir- the first words, or the, the extent of the love for the clubs, the first words that my dad said to me, he says, uh, when I was born was, up the clarets, and I was presented <laughs> with a Bertie B, a Bertie B teddy bear, so I don't think I really had a choice. Um, but it, it seemed as though everybody in school was a Blackburn fan, because at the time, Blackburn were the superior team. And I think that 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 drives the rivalry in the sense in that I, I, I to this day, I, I really dislike Blackburn, I hate them. People who say, "Oh, I'm a Blackman fan," I've got these like gut feeling in me. I'm like, "Oh no!" And I, I, you, you were writing that you were listening into a conversation uh, behind you, and someone, so and so, said, "Oh, but he, he's from Burnley. Oh, he's a dingo." <laughs> yeah. And you just, yeah, yeah. you just think, in no other sport would you, would you, would it seep into the public realm away from the ground? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I. I mean, I, I suppose I'm, I, I'm, I'm a rare sort of person, really, in in, in the fact that that I, I do have, I do have links with both clubs, and I don't think there won't be many people like me around, really. But Paul Fletcher said a wonderful thing, really. He said, on a Saturday, he said we should hate the opposition as much as we possibly can, but he said for the other six days of the week. He said we should just glorify the fact that football is a wonderful game, and 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 I thought that was a tremendous thing to say, really. Um, and I also think that 
we should respect other fans. You know, I, I wouldn't want you. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to convert you to be a Rovers fan. You know, I, 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 it, it's not right for me to try to do that. And, and likewise, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want you to to try and do the same, pull the same trick on me. Because you know, I respect you as a Burnley fan. You know what you said to me. You know, it's, you've you've grown in respect by saying that to me. You know, and and I just wish other fans could see that. You know, yeah, let's let's have a dig at them. Let's have a load of banter. Let's sort of knock them as much as we can, but let's respect them as well. Because if, if as in my case, if I'd have been born somewhere else, I, I, I would have been a fan of another club. And, and I, I think I, I just yeah. wish a lot of other people could could accept that point, really. Yeah, it's it's interesting in that it's one of the few games in in Britain. I think maybe Portsmouth and Southampton is the same, which which is a bubble game. Not only do fans get bussed between the grounds, you can't go to I can't go to Ewood without getting onto a bus which is transported down the M65 with a police escort. But it's not only that; the, the towns are practically shut throughout the day. You've got the shutters down on, on all the shops, and in no other in no other rivalry except maybe I say Southampton and and Portsmouth does does that happen it, it does do you think to you because I I have a difference of opinion with people uh on the non ever on the podcast with me in our enjoyment of this because for me as much as it'd be horrible to see any violence between the clubs I love I love going on to Blackburn on the the coaches and all going as one because it just adds to the in- intensity on that game do you think that this the the bubble system that's in place do you think that adds to the rivalry Although it obviously inconveniences people having to get up at 8 a.m. and travel to one ground to go to the other, I think it really adds it to the intensity when you're in the ground itself. Well, I'm so certain, yeah. And and it doesn't seem to put people off either, does it? You know, you know, <laughs> in, in, in the recent past, it hasn't put people off. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, it all adds to the camaraderie as well, doesn't it? It's, um, you know, if, you, if you're trying to build team spirit, it's a great way to build team spirit, isn't it? Um, no, I, 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 I think it has. And and I think it has worked, you know, from a police point of view, I think it has worked. Um, so, but, but I mean, I didn't know about Portsmouth and Southampton. I, I thought the Rovers and Berlin were the only ones, but they, they do it down there as well, do they? Well, occasionally, because... Yeah. I've heard, I've, I've, I've heard occasionally they don't play each other as much. Do they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it is interesting. I, know. I, I remember reading that, I think it might have been... Ross Wallace saw someone when they were travelling to Blackburn as part of the Burnley Burnley playing squad, and you, you see the the fans lined in the streets howling all sorts of abuse at, at, at you. It's no wonder that a lot of uh, not many players have played for both clubs. Uh, I think in recent years you've had Michael Keane, David Jones, Paul Robinson, but Keane and Jones were both lone players at Blackburn. Robinson was basically on his last legs, looking for a little payday at the end of his career uh, with Dyche. It's a real rarity that players play for both clubs do, do mm. you think there's any particular reason for this maybe it's it is it the club's unwillingness to do business with each other is it is it the fact that the players themselves aren't keen it's something we see in in football and i know you talked a lot about rivalries in general at the beginning of your book why why does why does it why does it happen so rarely that players play for both clubs in a rivalry I mean, I, I honestly don't don't know, I, and I've I've, I've never. It, 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 I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question, and, and I've, never, I've never really thought about it before. Um, and 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 some of the ones who who who, who have played, you know, have been nice to been properly signed by, but like Keith Newton, for example. I mean, he was Everton in between. Was Keith? Um, I mean, going back a long way, Jack Bruton was probably the best example of somebody who, who, who was a star player playing for Burnley. And he played, he was capped up for England playing for Burnley in the 20s. And he came to the Rovers and he had a great career at the Rovers as well. Um, I think him and Newton really were the, 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 the two best players who, who've played for both clubs. Um, can you contradict me on that? I don't, I mean, I've said that off the top of my head, but I, I think I might be right. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. I, yeah, I, it is. It yeah. is. It is. Uh, it is interesting that you bring that up. Uh, sorry, I, the connection meant I talked over you. Now I think, but I, I was just interesting that you picked up on the the best players to play for each club because 
I, I think you, I think you asked me there whether you would said something wrong, but I think you're at the best position to, to answer this sort of question because you have researched all these seasons. I mean, I'd love to hear you rave about Jimmy Mack for 10 minutes, but I, I do want to hear, know who do you think is the greatest to have played for each club because a name that stood out for me um, was Jack, Jack Southworth, I think his name was, a uh, Blackburn striker right at the turn of the 20th century who I obviously had never heard of, but yeah, yeah. from reading the book, I mean, he sounds like a cracking player. He was the Alan Shearer of his day, um, was Jack Southworth. Um, he, he, he topped the, 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 the country's goal scoring list one season. He, he, you can actually... You can often judge a striker by the number of goals per game, the the the, the percentage of goals per game, and I think Southworth was in the not point nine percent, which is, is is a tremendously high ratio. Um, I've not got that right, have I? It's not not point nine. Um, no, it's not point nine. There's no percent there. Not point nine um, goals a game. It's virtually a goal a game. You know over. You know, um, I don't know. He probably played about 80 games for the Rovers in Southworth. But Shearer was nearly there, you know. She- she- Shearer was in the point, point eights. Um, unbelievable statistic. Um, I mean, I, I from a Rovers point of view, I, I, I think um, you've got to put Southworth in there. Um, you've obviously got to put Shearer in there. You've got to put Clayton and Douglas in there. Um as you know, as being being the greats, and there's no doubt McElroy was was a genius. Um, we hated McElroy down at the down at Ewood. I mean, he he just ran the game. He he was like an orchestra conductor was McElroy. He and he didn't seem to run about that much particularly. I don't know. Maybe that's my memory playing tricks with me. But uh, but the ball always seemed to come to him. And of course, when it when it comes and it sticks perfectly. Of course, you don't have to move around that much because you're not you're not chasing after the ball. It's there, it's there exactly where you want it, and he, and I think I'll come on to Jimmy Adamson in a minute. But I think the combination of of, of Adamson being coached there and McElroy playing came out with with quite a few innovations in football. I'd never seen a short corner. Before until the Rovers had played Burnley. I mean, he might. I'm, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I, that I, that was my first memory of seeing a short corner. Um, and the way he could find Connolly, God, Connolly, Connolly was a nightmare to the Ewood defence. He was so quick and knocked those crosses over, and also he could score goals. Um, and of course, he played for both clubs, but it, he was getting towards the end of his career when he came to the Rovers. Although he did all right, but. Um, so you know, to me, in in my time, Jimmy Mac, Jimmy McElroy must be the best player who, 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 who's played for Burnley. Um, but date going back, the other guy called Bob Kelly, who I think has been capped for England more than any other Burnley player. I think I think I'm right in saying that. Um, he, he played. The, the Burnley had this wonderful side immediately after the First World War, um, when they won the league. Um, a tremendous side then, and Ken Kelly, I think, was the brains behind that. He was a, an, in, an inside right, as, as, as they used to call them then. Um, they had a guy called Crabtree as well, who, who, who played before the end of the 19th century, who eventually inevitably was sold to Aston Villa, um, where he went on to become an even greater player. But, but they reckon Crabtree in his day was the best player by a mile that Burnley had ever had. But what I wanted to say about Jimmy Adamson and Harry Potts was one thing that came out about this was that there's no doubt Harry Potts was a great manager, a great man manager. All the players say that. They all got on with him. He was dead straight. And if they had a problem, he he, he would do his best to sort, you know, problems off the pitch often because players, you know, they might have any sort of problem and they go to the manager, can you help me, boss, you know. And, And apparently Potts was brilliant at that. Adamson was a genius of a coach, um, but not a good man manager. So the players at the time said, um, which I found quite interesting, really. Um, but if you but if you can imagine that Potts was managing, Adamson was coaching at the same time. So uh, it's no wonder they had a great side, is it really? 
yeah, it's it's fascinating hearing you talk about all the, those players because I think for someone my age, it's incredible how the tale the tales of players from back then live live very long in the memory. I mean, you ask any Burnley fan worth his salt these days who the greatest player to ever played for for us is, and it's it's Jimmy McElroy, and it's because your dad's told yeah. you, your granddad's yeah. told you. Whoever it is, it's all, the, the tales are passed down the line. It to the point where, obviously, just before he died, he, he was for any for any Burnley fan of any age, he was the top tier, the the biggest class that you could get. I remember the week that he passed away, which was hor- awful news, but it was really poignant in the fact that Jimmy McElroy was the player who guided that incredible Burnley side that last won the league, you know, in nineteen sixty. But on the week he died, we were travelling to Olympiacos to go and play in the Europa League. And it was like, it was really special in that we've gone through all these ups and downs since then. But on the week he passed away, the Burnley squad was travelling to Athens to go and play European football in in Olympiacos' stadium that night. The, the chants for Jimmy McElroy were deafening. And it wasn't just, you know, the elderly folk who'd, who'd seen him play. It was young, young and old in between. So... It's incredible how the the tales of these players live long in memory. Yeah, and and I mean, I, I only met him once, I think, and but uh, I mean, my memory of him was being a very, quite a humble guy, really nice, you know, nice, pleasant, and so respectful, really, of, of anybody you spoke to. But anybody from that era will tell exactly the same story, you know, that, that he, he was a nice guy. And why did he get rid of him? You know, why did Burnley get rid of him? He went to Stoke, and he did well at Stoke, and. But I think Bob Lord knew he could get the money for him. But I don't think they ever really quite replaced him. Um, I don't think they've ever had a, a playmaker yeah, it's like just, that. It's, it's funny you say that. Yeah, but Bob Lord has that sort of reputation. Reputation. Um, it is It is quite funny that you say that you, you only met Jimmy, Jimmy once because I went, when I was young, I met him once. And exactly how, what you say, just an absolutely brilliant down-to-earth guy. It was it's funny how we we met him. I had bought when we first went up to the Premier League. Our our home kit was like a dedication to the the title winning kit. You know, mm. same design, no sponsor, no sponsor on the front, etc. And I, I, I got on the back. I, it 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 tells you how much the tale of these players lives on. Just completely off the back of me, not my dad or anything. I said I said to my dad, I want to get McElroy eight on the back of the shirt. That's who I want on the back of my shirt. It wasn't Chris Eagles. It was it was McElroy mm-hmm. eight. But at the time, we didn't we didn't quite know which number he played in most for Burnley, whether it was seven or whether it was eight. So what my dad did was think, well, there's only one man we can really ask, and that's Jimmy. So we found him in a yellow pages book at Jimmy McElroy Burnley. My dad rang him up, and he was like, oh yeah, this yeah it's it's, Jim, it's Jimmy yeah yeah no yeah I'd be happily yeah I played in number yeah. eight. And uh, we went down to a, to a, to a, an event and got it and got it signed by him, and I've still got that that shirt hung up yeah, to the yeah. day. But it really tells the tale of how how what a brilliant guy he was, and sort of leads on to my next next question, which was when you were researching the book and talking to all these ex players, what are some p- players in particular in particular you were fond of to talk to who had maybe some really good tales to tell more than others, and were just simply really approachable for you? Yeah, I mean also. I'll say I'll stick to Burnley here, obviously, you know, because I mean you you are a Burnley podcast, aren't you? Yeah, I mean Steve Kinden was so funny. Um <laughs> he told some great stories. Um I, I really enjoyed talking to him. And and, and I found Derek Scott really really easy to talk to. He told, he told this wonderful story to Derek because he, he finished playing football and he became a policeman. Now, you know, I don't think Cristiano Ronaldo's going to become a policeman, is he? You, you know what I mean? It's a different world, isn't it? And I said to him, I said, uh, you know, did when you were a policeman, did you have any trouble at, at sort of like derby games or, or, or at games generally? He said, no. He said, I was on traffic mainly. He said, so I didn't get involved in that. He said, but I got called up to an incident on, on, on I think, one of the housing estates in Burnley. And there was a standoff, and, and 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 this lad, a young man, and his dad. Well, I, I'm not sure if a knife. Or he was a young guy was going to stab his dad or something, and uh, and and so none of the police dare go in really. And this guy, 
as well as sort of watch, keeping an eye on his dad, was also keep looking out the window. And he saw Derek Scott come up and he opened the door. And he said, you, you can come in. <laughs> and so Derek said, I, I went in and we sat down there for 10 minutes. He said, and I, he just talked, you know, just talked generally. And, and then in the end, he said, I'm going to have to handcuff you and take you away. You know, he said, yeah, that's fine. That <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful story, really. Yeah, I think I think I think you, your mindset changes when you recognise someone and you've got respect for them. Yeah, okay, I, okay. If needs must, I'll get the handcuffs on. Yeah, yeah that's fine. And it's no way never. But I don't I don't want to take up all your time tonight, so I'll move on to some quick fire questions that I, I jotted down, um, which I think will be interesting about your sort of process of of writing the book in particular. Um, the first one is what what was does anything leap to the mind as that the hardest moment of writing a book? Were, were there any moments where you even questioned whether it was a, a good idea in itself? Well, I'll, I'll be honest. Right, when I say writing the book was easy, it, it was very, very time-consuming and um, led to you know um, several sort of tiffs with my wife. We said, oh, you're still on that? Well, you can guess what she said, you know. But um, I, I love the writing of it. Finding photographs has been a nightmare. Um, particularly with the lockdown, that 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 that's been the big bugbear. That slowed us down because we couldn't get into archives, and then I don't know, you, you, the, this there's this Getty images who seem to have almost a monopoly of of pictures, and, and you, you can't get to them. And um, it, it, it's the last few months have been far harder than the the year or so it took me to write it. Really, I mean, it was a labour of love. Basically, that's what I'm saying. Writing was a labour of love. Finding pictures, <laughs> pictures certainly wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. I do, I do a bit of writing uh, on on cycling, funnily enough, and the, it's it's the images which are the killer. It's not it's yeah. not the writing. It's it's the process of putting that yeah. into production. Um, but are there any authors, uh, authors in particular, that maybe you looked for for inspiration when you decided to take up the project of writing this book? Are there any that jumped to mind as you know you just love reading their work? No, I, um, but I, I I did sort of go through the, the Mike Jackman has written two or three books about the Rovers, and and um, ironically he, he 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 ran the Blackburn and Darwin schools primary setup when I ran the secondary setup, so so I know Mike quite well, but it, it, his books are quite tremendous, and you know, and you. I mean, you don't copy them, but but you 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 read them. You know, well, is there anything I'm missing here? You know, kind of you know, kind of look at this a little bit differently. And uh, Burnley, the uh, I can't remember. I see it. I see the book. This wonderful book from Burnley. Um, <laughs> it's like the moment. What's the guy's? Yeah. Um, You're gonna give me something new to add to my reading list here. I can I can feel it. <laughs> Ray, Ray Simpson. I've I've read some works by Ray Simpson on Burnley, and and again. You know, I, I've never met him, but I, I could imagine having a conversation with him for about six hours, really, you know, with with, with, with some of the stuff he, he, he told, you know. They were they were great helps to me. Did you did you always, um, obviously you said that this idea sort of came to you a few, a few years ago. Did you always harbour the, the ambitions to, to, to write a, a big book uh, in your lifetime? And why? Why was this? Why did this come to mind a few years ago? Why why did it all come about? Well, no, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I was heavily heavily involved in teaching, um, and then we went to live in France for thirteen years, and um, and it was right at the very end of when we were deciding to come back. I suddenly got the idea that um, I think because I miss football so much, we lived in the in the southwest of France, which is rugby union land. And um, we lived in a quite a big village and there wasn't, there wasn't even a set of goalposts in this village. So I used to go down on a Sunday to watch the local rugby club, you know. The nearest big club was Bordeaux. It was about a two and a half mile uh, hour journey away, you know, because that's what France is like, you know. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, the idea just came to me and I started looking at things. And you do, you do some research, you, you get facts and figures, you know, and I think I think that the, the getting getting st statistics down can can often sort of lead you down down the right path. Really, it, it sort of guides you in, in directions to go to, and and 
but I'd, I'd never, I mean, I'd, I hadn't gone through life wanting to be an author at all. If, if I could, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm an author now, but, you know, to be in my mid 70s, you know, I, sort of, I've almost reinvented myself, really. Yeah, I, I definitely class you as an author. I'd be very proud if I, if I managed to get to write, write this sort of book. Uh, are there any, you've caught the book, you've caught the bug now. Are there any more ideas on the horizon for a Burnley or a, a Blackman related book? I know, I know you said to the Radio Lancashire that maybe something like a Blackpool versus Preston wouldn't. You won't fancy it because you live through this book as a project. But you know you've got your ties to Burnley and Blackburn. Is there any more ideas in the pipeline? Well, I've I've sort of half written a book already about the Rovers, but I'm I'm umming and eyeing about that at the moment because you, you know I'm, I'm I mean it's not a cheap book. I mean it's, it's there's no change out of twenty five quid for it, and. You know, I, I think if sort of in the next year after I put another one out about the Rovers, I think I think I'd be pushing my luck a bit, really, even though it would be completely different. And and the funny thing is, I I have begun to think about the the Burnley the the um, the, the Blackpool uh, Preston one a, a little bit more in the last few weeks. I, um, whether I will ever do it or not, I don't know. I need to talk to people over there. Um, Andy, Andy, I find Andy, you know Andy Bays, the the on Radio Lancashire. I find I find him very a, a very useful source of wisdom, really. But but he knows so many people, you know. And um, and you, I, I I if I if somebody had to ask me what do you th- what do I think is the best bit about the book, I think it's the fact that I've managed to get the views of so many different people. And so to get the views of a lot of people, you you've got to either be introduced to a lot of people. I got you've got to know a lot of people. Well, I don't know so many people over over Black Blackpool and Preston, but you know, so I'd need people to introduce me to people. Really, that would that that would have to be the first the first step. Yeah, well, I th- I think you've definitely I think you've definitely got the bug now. I'd love to I'd love to see another Bur- a Burnley book a Burnley well, book out of you. I might I might not be investing. I'm sorry, Mike. I might not be investing in the Blackburn book. I've got to break it to you. <laughs> No, um, I, 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 would, I, I, would, I would almost be disappointed in you, really, if you did, you know, if, if you did buy a book on Blackburn, you know. If, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think there's been a lot of good books written on Burnley. Um, and and I, 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 I can't think of a, of a book on Burnley that I could write at the moment. But you never know, do you? Who knows? Who knows it? I, I, I'm sure, like, like your know, ideas suddenly whiz into your head, don't they? From, from nowhere, really. So who knows? I, I, f- I think you've got to wait around until we, uh, we make it 35 years yeah. since Blackburn yeah, yeah. beating Burnley, and there might be another, a tale, there might be another tale or two held within there. Uh, one final question for you, and it's, uh, it's the, it's the title of the last chapter of the book, really. Uh, in, in terms of the Burnley and Blackburn rivalry, can it? Should it? Will it ever end? Without giving too much, without giving the game away about the the book in itself, what do you think about this? Well, it, I'm I'm positive and negative about football generally. Um, <clears throat> when I played in the Blackburn combination, there were five divisions. There are now two. I also played for a while in the Dorman League. There now is no Dorman League, so I, I think there's a lot less people playing eleven side football. Having said that. Junior football, kids' football has absolutely sprouted, you know, and kids are playing football at a very, very young age now, far younger than than, than we ever did. I mean, school football has gone down the drain, but 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 the um, the, the the junior stuff is big. Will they keep on um, being interested in football? Again, we're into crystal ball land here, aren't we? I don't know, but but I I think football football can carry on. For, for for a long while um and as long as you can get people interested in putting money into Burnley and, and Blackburn Rovers then there's absolutely no reason why those two clubs shouldn't continue to battle probably sort of a, a, a give or take a, a, a an equal level really you know there'll, there'll be seesaw stuff ups and downs but you know I, I think that can happen um should it? I think. I think football gives so much to 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 the country. Really, 
I mean, there's nothing like a team game. You know, I mean, I've played a lot of golf and I've played quite a bit of tennis. But, you know, where there's 10 other guys with you, you there's something special about that. There's something special playing in teams. And that I think that's one of the great things about football. And um, and and you learn, so, you learn so many life skills playing. You know, saying to the opposition, you know, they, they might, you might have been trying to kick him to death during the game, but shake hands with him at the end and say, well done, or something like that. You know, there's something rather special about that. You know, and it, it, if we can keep things like that going, the, 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 the country will learn from that. Um, and also, it, you know, we, life's not that easy, really. I mean, I mean, we know the last 18 months have been hell, haven't they, really? And, and to some extent, I think, I think football has helped to keep things going. Um, England's success in the Euros, sort of, the, uh, as that was coming to a close, I think it was quite marvellous for the country, really. It gave them something positive to focus on. So, yeah, I, I, it, it certainly should keep going. Um, it can, you know, there's no reason why it can't. And, and I, think it, I think it will. Yeah, it's a, a brilliant note to end on that. I just think the, the, the return of, the, you know, the Euros over the summer and the return of fans at the start yeah, of this yeah. season, it's just given this whole renewed optimism to everybody. I mean, I've not felt the, the way I, I did against, we, we played Leeds just before the international break and uh, it was a brilliant game. It ended 1-0, but it was an absolutely barnstorming mm. game. And with, with the Leeds fans there and, and our fans and obviously Lancashire versus Yorkshire, it was just something so special and it's something that the, the pandemic ripped away from us. And I think if that's how it felt for, for a Leeds game, I just I just can't wait until until another Burnley and Blackburn game. It'll be it might be some time yet, but as I said to Chris Sutton, we, we might have to hope that the FA Cup throws us something after the new year. Yeah, yeah. Well they certainly the, the, the League Cup certainly won't this season now because after the abysmal performance by the Rovers against Markham, I mean it's slumped out of that, but Burnley is still going. I mean, Burnley do not have a good record. Sean Dyche has not got a good record in the League Cup at all. Um, it's very, very poor, but but he's he won twice now, haven't you? Yeah, he won, he won two games. We've not we've not got a good record. We've not got a good record in any cup under Sean Dyche, no. I'm afraid. It's not the priority. Um, so I think it, it dwindles down the opportunities for us to play Blackburn until we... Uh, we get relegated, but so, someday it will happen. It will be a, a marvellous a marvellous occasion indeed, especially with fans back. I think the last time was 2017, wasn't it? And it wasn't the most competitive of fixtures. So even though I really don't really hope Blackburn do well, hopefully we, get, we do get on an even keel soon and we have a competitive fixture. Uh, but it's been brilliant speaking to you, Michael. I don't want to take up the rest of your night. So before we go, um, just, just let us know again where we can get the book and does does it have a release date yet? Yeah, I know I've got a, a pre-release copy, so I'm in the privileged position. But for our listeners, when is it going on sale? Well, it, it it's the very, very end of September, but maybe it might creep into the very, very beginning of October. But but it's about then. And if if you look on, on, on the internet at Legends Publishing, he, he, the guy Dave Lane has, uh, has published, publishes about six or seven books a year. For all, all football, it's niche. It's niche football stuff. It's uh, you know, it's not. It's not Al, an Alec Ferguson biography and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's about the nitty gritty of football. And then he, he's produced some good books, and and hopefully this this will come out as as well. Yeah, the, the better tales are. Yeah, like can I just say <laughs> what what a, what a refreshing pleasure it has been to speak to you. You know. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. And it's been brilliant having you on the podcast. I think all our listeners are going to absolutely. Love this. And before I go, I must say thanks to producer Matt who puts all yeah. this show together. And without him, the, p- the podcast really wouldn't run. I know, Michael, we got off to a, a couple of technical issues at the start, but Michael's, M- Michael saw that Matt's always at the helm, ready to uh, get us out of the mire. So I- I've got to say thanks to producer Matt. Thanks to Michael again for coming on. Remember, guys, go to Legends Publishing to purchase the new Known Aid Ever book. Uh, I think it's very appropriate that we've got Michael on the No Near Never podcast this week. Such a brilliant chant, uh, brilliant book, and it really is your go-to guide for the the history of the two clubs, but both but completely intertwined with each other throughout throughout both our long and storied histories. So thanks again for coming on, Michael, and f- 
thanks again to all you listeners for tuning in. We'll be back after the international break. So after Patrick Bamford's done oh, <laughs> running around in an England shirt, completely undeserved, my ass here. That, that's the only d- bit of punditry I'll do on this week's show. But thanks again, Michael. It's been a pleasure. And listeners, we'll see you after the international break with the preview show. Thanks again, everyone. So the bit where um, great, um, Kevin Ball was driving home after that horrendous tackle on David Dunn and he phoned his wife and, uh, and his wife was so he, he said, you don't think it was a foul, do you? She said, a foul? She said, I'm, t- I'm surprised you didn't lock you up. <laughs>